Shane. Brent. We're live. <laughs> My all the pre all the pregame stuff is over now. We can finally get down to get down to business. So um, hey, as always, I really, really appreciate you joining us for um, these Raid Your Sellers sponsored by Benchmark Wines. And um, it's really nice of you to join us again. I really appreciate it. Well, it's always great to drink wine with you and catch up. And, uh, you know, Benchmark is, uh, they, they never put out a bad wine. So when you say Benchmark, <laughs> I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in every time. Awesome. We appreciate that, Shane. And um, there's a lot of people who are joining us from all over. Um, so we're going to take uh, some questions a little bit later on. And, and obviously, uh, you being a, a big wine lover, but also uh, a member of um, a couple of different basketball teams, um, most recently the Miami Heat, which I now know, obviously, that you work for. Um, but we can talk a little bit about your, um, your charity work as well, because I know that's really important to you. And I've been lucky enough to, to participate in that. But, uh, but to get things rolling, Shane, it's been quite a while, but cheers, salud you and your family. Um, I know that uh, we're going to focus on the pink stuff tonight and then talk a little bit about it. Yeah, what are, what are, we, what are we drinking tonight? So I always look at uh, rosé, um, I kind of joke about it and call it like adult Gatorade. This is the, the, the fun, fresh stuff that is so awesome during warm weather. Um, it's a style of wine that you find, especially in the south of France, where this just goes really well with their styles of food. If you think about it, it's got a really hot climate. Um, a lot of fish and shellfish and these kinds of wines, um, almost I think of it as really good rosé to me. It's like red wine you can chill, um, do really well with the food, the cuisine, um, that sort of Mediterranean uh, uh, climate. Uh, these, these wines go absolutely uh, amazing with. Um, I'm real excited because uh, Shane, you've obviously known some of the projects that, that I've been involved with in the wine space. And um, this is actually a new wine that we're trying for the first time. Uh, a lot of people out there don't probably know about it, but this is uh, Sidelight. So this is a rosé um, that is crafted in Central California. So although most of my work is done in Napa. Um, this comes from Central California, and like a lot of rosés, it's a um, a blend of a couple different varieties, primarily Grenache, Syrah, and Morved. And I think Shane, the last tasting that we did together, um, we actually covered Grenache pretty extensively. It's a variety that I produce, and um, it's a wonderful variety from. Um, uh, it's actually one of the world's most widely planted grape varieties. And you don't see a lot of it in Napa, but you do see it in other parts of, uh, of California. But, um, you know, as you look at it, a lot of people will say, okay, what, you know, it's, it's, um, it's obviously pink and, you know, how do you get that, uh, how do you get that color? And that's probably one of the most interesting things about rosé is that um, it's kind of in that, literally in the in-between of white and red. And in terms of its style of production, you're getting kind of the best of, of both worlds. Um, I know you've spent a uh, 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 large amount of time at different wineries, and you've probably seen some of the behind the scenes, you know, production stuff. And when we bring in fruit, um, after we go through the process of, of destemming, for the most part, as these grapes kind of sit in tank or in really any kind of vessel, um, gravity kind of begins to do the work of, you know, pressing down on this, on, on, on the the grapes below, and you begin to kind of leach out some juice. And that juice typically, um, actually for almost 99% of all the grapes out there in the world is gonna be clear. So it's not, you don't get this color, you know, in the beginning, you get clear juice with just about every kind of wine. Um, but after about 12 to 24 hours of the skin, staying in contact with the juice, uh, you begin to get this color. And the longer you leave the skins in um, with the juice, you'll begin to bleed out a little bit more color um, and depending how long you do it you can go from a very light sort of you know pale almost um, like cantaloupe colored uh, rosé to something that's actually pretty dark once again the longer you leave the skins in contact with uh, with that juice um, typically what winemakers will do does the time spent to touching the skins does that affect the taste at all or is it just the coloring uh, no actually it's a good question because it actually does affect um, a lot of the flavor so um, when we're um, sort of the fancy term for for color is um, is anthocyan. So so antho in Greek is flower and cyan is obviously you know color related. 
And, um, and that's kind of what gets pulled out from the skins, but also you get a lot of other potential aromatic and flavor compounds in the skin. So as you know, because I know the style, I think I know most of the styles of wine you like, those bigger, bolder, heavier reds usually have a lot more skin contact. You can just tell by, and I've got a glass of red here um, uh, from, uh, from Del Dotto Vineyards. You can see it's a little bit, it's obviously darker, but um, the more skin contact, the more you'll pull out a lot more of that color. But the other thing you pull out is something called tannin, which is almost that astringent quality you get where, you know, literally scientifically, um, the tannin in the wine is binding to protein in your saliva and kind of making it fall to solution for a bit. So it's almost like drying your gums out in a way. Um, with these lighter colored wines, you don't, you don't really get that. So yeah, there's a lot of other things in there, not just the color that you can pull out. So I'm sure you'd probably agree that rosés, even though they're, they're flavorful, they don't have maybe the depth that you get with, um, with some red wines. Yeah. And that's why we drink it in the summer, you know? I'm yeah, exactly. Miami. Living in Miami, this is, it is like Gatorade, you know? I mean, you, you don't, you, you don't go to uh, a barbecue, you don't go on a boat trip without packing uh, a few bottles of rosé and it, go, it goes pretty quick <laughs> in, the, in, in the Miami sun. I would imagine. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because um, I've always, I, I do know kind of your, some of your first, first exposure to wine, but I mean, do you remember trying rosé for the first time by any chance? Because um, I know I associate it with when I was much younger um, with like white Zinfandel, which is sort of yeah. that sweeter, more cloying style of, um, uh, of wine. But um, do you happen to remember when you, when you yeah. tried rosé for the first time? White Zinfandel, you know, outside of going to a communion at church, White Zinfandel <laughs> was, was my first uh, exposure to to wine. Okay. And it was like, it was like a gummy bear. I mean, looking back at it, I, I couldn't fathom pouring a glass of White Zin or at least the stuff that I drank, you know, when I was, uh, you know, of, of age. And I, I thought right. that was so good. But it was, it was like, it was, it was light. It wasn't too, wasn't too crazy. Wine is super intimidating. Sure. Um, and so, you know, obviously as you mature and you, you start tasting like what good stuff is by going to Napa and other places, um, you know, you realize how, uh, how, how young you were drinking white Zin. And so you have a little apprehension towards rosé, you know, when you, we, we, you know, sure. you, a, a, as someone who appreciates wine and wants to be known as sort of a wine sophisticated and know what they're talking about, um, it, it took me a long time to come around on rosé just because I didn't want people to think I was drinking white Zin. And, um, but now like I, I really appreciate a good rosé and you understand after tasting all the wines of the world and, um, and just understanding the, the complexities of, of wine, um, you know, a, a really smooth, nice rosé is, is, is super nice. It's super nice. And it's, it's, it's nuanced in a way that, that white wines and, and red wines uh, aren't. And so it's, it's really cool. So as you get more experience in, in, in wines, rosé is a, an area, you know, not just to, to, to guzzle on a hot day, you know, in, in the sun, but it, it's something to be savored and something that be something to have with meals. And, and, you know, I don't know if that was always the case, but there's some, some, some really, really good producers of, of, uh, of rosé, um, you know, Sidelight being one of them. This is, this is an excellent rosé. Uh, but I can see this on a, on a summer day or uh, with a barbecue or, or with a piece of fish. And um, that's, that's the fun of wine. That's, that's, the, that's the fun of what we do. And, and just seeing what can go with what. And, you know, the only rules, there are no rules. And that's, that's, right. that's the beauty of, of what we're drinking. That's right. And it's funny because you mentioned um, that was sort of, uh, I, I was lucky enough to have parents let me try wine every now and again, but, but uh, you know, White Zin was kind of like that gateway drug. So, um, you know, that's maybe not the best term to describe it, but, you know, I'd hear people sometimes in the wine profession, you know, wine professionals sometimes knock it. And um, it was, uh, uh, I actually was in a discussion one time and it, uh, someone was talking, kind of knocking White Zin Fidel. And, you know, one of the panels was like, wait a second, do you know how many people this actually got into the wine world from, you know, just trying this and kind of worked their way into enjoying wine a little bit more? And so um, I think that's one thing to remember is that it did get a lot of people, you included, it sounds like, you know, into, into drinking wine, maybe trying uh, some more. But I think to your point, there was a, a, a time when um, I would probably say even just 10 years ago when you would try to recommend rosé to people. And what was the first thing they would say? They would say, oh, wait a second. I, I don't, yeah, it's going to be too sweet. I know what rosé is. And it took a long time. And 
Um, I think of, as I mentioned, sort of in the top of our, um, uh, the top of this broadcast, when we were talking about um, uh, Provence in the south of France. So if you just think about that climate where it's hot, um, in the history of wine production in France goes back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, they've kind of, those wines kind of evolved around not just the food of that region, but it evolved kind of around the climate of that area too. And who wants to drink? Well, I'm sitting here in Austin, Texas right now, which I don't know if I told everyone where Cabernet is king. And I don't understand even on a, it's right now it's 97 degrees, um, how they can be drinking intense Cabernet, but God bless those Texans because they keep Napa afloat. Uh -huh. um, but I think Rosé is more, you know, stylized to this kind of climate, but hundreds of years of production, you've got, um, you know, a region that has grown where I think Provence roughly 80% of their production is almost, is almost Rosé. So not white, not red, but the pink stuff. And um, it's because it goes so well with the climate. It goes so well with the food. And, um, you know, you mentioned the food component as well, but, um, you know, even on a, as I know you love to play uh, golf. This is one of the perfect beverages on a, on a golf course. It is. Although I have, I have not tried that. <laughs> <laughs> I love my Next golf, Brad. This, you know, this will make me a little too chill. So uh, this this is a great after after golf uh, activity beverage, probably. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I know that there's uh, th there's obviously people who want to ask questions, but Shane, I just want to cover a couple of non wine stuff if you don't mind, because um, for people who may not know your your basketball pedigree, you were um, a sent out player at Duke University, and. Um, what do you think of the news of, uh, of Coach K finally retiring? Was that something that uh, you maybe saw coming down uh, you know, the pipeline or, or was it a surprise well, to you? No. Look, Brent, you know, Coach K is 75 years old. He's been at Duke as long as I've been alive, and, <laughs> um, you know, which, is, which is crazy. And so sure. uh, you know, I'm happy that he has closure to, uh, to, to announce he's stepping away. It's, it's super hard, you know, this, this is a life that's all he's known for four decades now. And um, it's hard for anyone who's had that much success to say, you know what, it's time for me to exit and let someone else do a, do the job. So I'm, I'm happy that he has, has closure. I'm happy he gets one more year. I'll, I'll get to see him multiple times this year and, and, uh, and, and take it all in. I wouldn't be here without the lessons that Coach K gave me. And so um, I'm just super happy for him as, as a friend and as a mentor that, you know, he can pursue some other, other opportunities, some other dreams. You know, I don't know what he wants to accomplish, you know, post basketball, but he'll have the time to do it. And, and Duke basketball will be okay. Uh, John Shire is, is taking over for coach K John's a super energetic, great young coach. Um, I've known him for, for many, many years and, and have been a quasi mentor to him. He, I think he's ready uh, to take the reins. It's, it's a tough job, man. Replacing the legend. It's never easy, it's never easy, but John's going to do a great job to, 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 shape Duke basketball and into his vision and uh, we'll have the full support of the players that, that played for coach K and, and in the, the program, but it's, it's going to be a fun year. It's going to be a fun year to reminisce and, and talk about coach K stories. And um, you know, I'm, you know, I have a different relationship with coach K than most people, like most people defer to him or are differential. Um, I bust the shops. <laughs> And that's why he loves me. You know, and I think when you're, you have your jersey retired, you get that license. But, uh, but just, you know, for a guy who I love and I wouldn't be here today without him, um, I'm just happy for, for him to have closure and, and hopefully he can end this year on a high note. That's great. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Sean, I don't know if I ever told you this, but um, uh, John didn't come up, but his wife actually came to Outpost, uh, a winery that I used to where I know that I've had the pleasure to interact with you in a couple different cities, but um, uh, of course, in Napa being one of them, but um, a winery that you know well, and um, it was really nice to, to meet her. And, and I'm really excited for, uh, for them. That's going to be, that's going to be great. Yep. Yep. Coach K loves his wine. You know, for those, I was going to say, K, he, I wouldn't be surprised if he spends most of his time in Napa. I mean, he is a big, big wino and in a good way. And um and so I always love visiting Coach K because he always brings up the good stuff. <laughs> That's great. And I also know that, um, you know, he was, um, he still is, of course, um, heavily involved with the Jimmy V Foundation. And they've got a pretty decent sized wine component to that, uh, that charity as well. And um, I don't know if you've come out for the Jimmy V stuff in Napa, but certainly Coach K I know has. And um, hopefully he'll, he'll continue to do that. And um, in addition to spending probably more time with his family than he's been able to do uh, in the past. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Um, well, Shane, also, um, you know, one of the other things I've been able to work with you on in the past is um, your charity, the Shane Take Charge Foundation. And one of the signature events, which I've seen evolve, which has been really fun, is the Cabernet with Battier. And um, for those of you who, uh, who, who don't know about Shane's charity, we actually put a link in the, um, in the chat thread. So if you can open that, maybe on the, if you haven't already on the side of your, uh, of your browser window here, uh, you'll see that. But um, if you can, Shane, maybe just tell us a little bit about the charity. Um, I've seen some of the graduates um, and uh, I know a couple of them are going to, uh, to Texas, a school that I attended here. Well, not here because I'm in Austin. They would shoot me if yep. they heard me say uh, Texas A&M. But it's really neat to see some of those kids go off. And, um, and also um, kind of the, maybe a little bit about the event and then a little bit about um, what your students are doing right now. Yeah. Well, look, Brent, you know, I, I was lucky to be 6'8 in eighth grade. All right. And pretty coordinated. So um, I was lucky to stay healthy and be able to write my, uh, my ticket through basketball. Um, and school, I, I was an excellent student. But if I didn't have those two, if I didn't have those two things, I knew my my opportunity to be, would be very limited. And so, uh, I had a great appreciation for every opportunity that I was given, and I tried to make the most of it. And so, when I said when I made it to the NBA finally, and I played 13 years in the NBA, you know, I said to myself, "Self, it's, it's time to find kids who are like me, who have the talent, the drive, the discipline, uh, maybe not the opportunity to reach their goals through a college education." And so we created the Battier Take Charge Foundation uh, 11 years ago. And uh, we, our, our goal is simple, is to, to help kids who were like me and in situations that um, they just need a little bit of support. And over the last 11, year, we, 11 years, uh, we've given away over $2.3 million in college That's scholarships, great. which is mind blowing. Um, have, you know, well, well over 60 kids in our program. And, um, you know, just the stories that we hear from the kids who just needed a little boost, a little help, the things they're doing now. We had one of the teachers who was a teacher of the year in Texas, uh, was one of our students. We were first doctoral. Oh, wow. Candidate. We have, we have lawyers, we have, uh, you know, budding doctors, um, but it's, it's amazing um, that we're able to build community. And that's, that's what, you know, we're, we're super proud of using our platform having a great time, you know, Benchmark is, is committed to pouring at, at Battier or, or Cabernet with Battier. Uh, Brent, you've been an amazing supporter of, of what we, Thank what you. we try to do. And that's, that's what it's about. This is, this, this is about, uh, it's about giving back. It's about coming together, you know, where we, we're all just individuals, but when we band our resources, our time and our energy, energies, we can help a lot of people and make our community um, a much better place to live and, and, and create opportunity, which is what, what it's all about. And so we're super proud um of uh, uh, what we created here and want to keep it rolling and uh we're always trying to do more so that's why we throw fun parties and uh, if we're gonna throw a party and raise money may as well be super fun that's right and include wine too and shane yes. um there's a link actually to your charity that we put in the chat thread so that way um, folks can um, check in i know that this one of the signature events um for selfish reasons that i love to to attend is the cabernet with battier um which uh for those of you out there who um who don't know about it or haven't participated in one of our discussions before um what happens is uh all these great vintners from napa not necessarily napa but mostly from napa come in and do this great open house tasting where um, uh, uh, people can come in and actually taste a lot of these wines. And then there's usually a dinner component and then, um, a, uh, an auction, which is, which is great. There's a lot of fun items and it's a great way to interact with, uh, with producers, owners of wineries, um, taste some amazing wine. And I promise you the ticket price pays for all that wine. I mean, you would never taste those, those wines in a lot of other places. So you definitely get your, get your money's worth. Um, and obviously, as you heard, it goes to a, it goes to a, um, a great cause. Um, but if uh, Shane, if I'm not mistaken, if people go on your site, they can sign up for a newsletter, I assume, or at least yep. put their name in. Yep. And get when that date comes list. out, they can do it. Yep. Get on the man, get, get on the mailing list and uh, you, you'll get plenty of, of uh, notice uh, the events in Miami. So who doesn't love Miami in January, February, when the rest of the world is shoveling snow and we're, you know, we're in flip flops and drink, drinking rosé. Uh, so come on down. It's, I promise you, you'll have an, an unbelievable time and uh, more importantly, raise a lot of money uh, for, for great 
kids and uh, and scholarships and and creating opportunities. So it's it's, it's a win 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 win. So ta- uh, Battier take charge, um, or take charge foundation The links in in the uh, the chat room in the bio, and uh, we're doing we're doing great things and we love new friends. So so come on out. It's a it's a I promise you I I do a lot of events wine related and this one is easily the best and the most fun. Um, Shane, we got a question. I thought this, you know, I don't know if you know this, but but uh, my brother-in-law is Italian, and I thought maybe this was him saying it was someone from Italy, but different name here. This is uh, this is Luca, and Luca's got a question for you. Um, so he's he's chiming in from Italy. I don't know exactly what part, but he says, Shane, what other sports do you follow with a passion? You know what? I I am a golfer now. People ask me, do I play basketball anymore? And I have not played basketball since I retired in 2014. Uh, I have a 13 year, 13 year old son who's almost six feet now, and you know he's getting a little brave and thinks he can beat dad. He'll never beat dad. All right, I'm I'm very tough on him, uh, so I don't play him, but I, I'll you know still show that I shoot. But I every day I I can golf. I will golf, and so I love golf. Um, I'm very passionate. So all, all the the dedication and discipline I use for basketball, I now transfer to golf. Um, but Luca, I, have, I also have become a huge football fan and I've so enjoyed the, the Euro two, 2020 competition. Italy is, has looked, you know, pre- pretty strong, pretty strong. I know you probably wish they'd score a few more goals, but uh, I'm excited for the knockout phase. So, um, you know, I love Italy. I love going to Italy. So I'll, I, I'll be cheering for them in the, uh, in, in the Euros. So I love that. Ba- I love golf and I love basketball. And in fact, um, I love golf so much. I'm doing like a side fundraiser. I, I started a, I've started a golf apparel line called rolling greens. When you think of golf, you just think of the rolling hills and when the ball's rolling on the green, it's just so pretty. And so there's a link in, in the, the chat room that, that Brent will put up. Uh, you can actually buy a bucket hat that I created. I love bucket hats. All right. They protect your, 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 your nice skin from skin cancer. You look kind of goofy, but you know, when you're golfing, you want to look kind of goofy to like, you know, lull your opponent into a false sense of confidence. So uh, you can buy a bucket hat that will support Battier Take Charge Foundation. All the proceeds go to charity. Um, and so I'm super proud of my, my golfing bucket hat or rosé hat or beach hat, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, but the links, the, the bio, the link, link is in the bio. Um, so it combines my love for golf, hanging out, being in the sunshine. Let's go Italy. Absolutely. Uh, Luca just, I don't know if you can see that, Shane. He was, he said that's exactly what he wanted to hear. So he's very, uh, very excited. And I, yeah, I know they drew a tough team, I think, from what I heard from my brother-in-law. So I know they're going to have a tough matchup. Tough matchup. Yeah, a tough matchup. Um, Shane, so we did put that link um, in the description. I'm sorry, in the chat thread. We just put it up there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure maybe, you know, you could even throw in emergency situations, flip it over or throw some ice in there and put a bottle of rosé and maybe uh, sure. at least for a limited amount of time, keep it cold. <laughs> anyway, um, well, awesome. So, um, so yeah, maybe diving back into, uh, back into wine. So Shane, I don't know if you tried the side light before, or is this your first time trying it? The first time. It's the first awesome. Time. So this is, so, this is uh, central Valley, California. Yeah. So, so we're talking about the central coast. So as you know, Napa is kind of Napa and Sonoma kind of are at the, um, just North of San Francisco and kind of, you know, form this little like V shape of these two regions separated by a, a mountain range. Um, this comes from, Further south, um, where varieties like Grenache, Syrah, Morvedra, um, they, they uh, a little bit more of those varieties down there. And um, there's a Cabernet Sauvignon comp- uh, counterpart to this wine, which I'd love for you to try. It's in, actually in barrel right now. We won't release it for another couple of months. Um, but um, this is produced in, when I said that Provencal style, what I was trying to um, convey, and for those of you out there that are tasting this, including Shane, you'll get this. Um, this is a low alcohol wine, meaning that um, the al- uh, not that high alcohol is bad, but um, it just doesn't have the punch that a lot of really intense red wines do, like a lot of our Napa cabs. Um, it fairly has a fairly high acid level to it, so it's crisp and, you know, also refreshing. And, and obviously it doesn't have, um, if I wish we had maybe another rosé to compare this to, but um, in the glass, honestly, this thing is a light rosé. I mean, it is, if you look at the spectrum of rosé wines, this is sort of on the, you know, if you look at it like milk, this is like the skim milk version. This is very, very light, very crisp, 
uh, very refreshing and um, doesn't have a, a ton of complexity to it. It's still really, really aromatic, but, but not really, not really intense. And you can certainly, you know, if you're kind of counting alcohol level, you can certainly drink a lot more of this than most, you know, than most, uh, most red wines. Um, you can also put it in a plastic cup and not feel so guilty. Um, that's the way I think rosé, rosé should, should be enjoyed. Um, and Shane, I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, this was completely by accident. I've known you for a while, but, um, this label looks very similar for those of you in the, can Google this, you know, really quickly, or maybe, uh, if, if one of you at benchmark could paste the graphic in the chat that are a link to it. If you look up, if you type in, let's see, they'd have to say Miami heat vice Jersey, right? Yep. So it was called the Vice Jersey. If you look at it, you will see an incredible similarity to, uh, to this label. I promise you, we did not, uh, we did not have um, uh, this in mind, but uh, we had a great label designer who we conveyed exactly what we were looking for uh, in this label. But I promise you, if you put those two side by side, you will think that um, yeah, they're they're uh, they're brothers, they're brothers. So um, I think you guys just retired that jersey too, right? It's like yeah. kind of yeah. done yeah. with. It was the best. It was the best-selling alternative jersey in NBA history, and so the my, my, my Miami Heat, um, you know, have done a fantastic job of marketing and uh, created a jersey that uh, it captures Miami, which is kind of dangerous, kind of sexy, uh, kind of mysterious in, in a basketball uniform, which is very much like the Sidelight uh, uh, label. So it's, it's pretty cool, pretty cool synergy. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so Shane, we've got two wines. Um, why don't I introduce the, uh, the other wine because um, there's an interesting connection to it. So um, we're going to switch over to a little bit of, uh, of bubbles now. And um, yeah, there it is. Look, Shane's got it. Be careful of that cork. I don't want that thing to fly out and, you know, hit somebody. Um, this is Unfem. If, and if, if I had my lance, I would lance it off, Brent. I'm a very, I'm a very good, you know, lancer. lancer. <laughs> Those are great at parties. Yeah, well, you need to have one of those giant like uh, Sinbad swords, yeah. you know, the ones you could really, you know, make a statement with. Um, so Shane, this is the um, Unfem, which is a, um, it's a fairly new company in Napa that has a pretty interesting message there. Um, this sort of is a women owned, um, women winemaker uh, focused uh, business and some of their profits do go to charity as well called Dress With Success. Um, this is a um, obviously a sparkling wine, as you can tell. And what's interesting is that, you know, we think of um, of, of rosé kind of in that same style of being something that might be, you know, when you see it sweet or, or cloying. Uh, this is you can as you're tasting right now a very dry, uh, yeah. a very dry sparkling wine. Um, this wine is produced by Samantha Sheehan, and um, she and I actually worked together on a project a long time ago that was um, a wine, another Napa-based uh, Napa based project. Um, but she is, if I'm not mistaken, she's an SMU graduate, so went to school where, where I am right now, uh, well, here in Texas, but SMU being in Dallas. And she's got a lot of different projects. One is called Poe Wines, P-O-E, uh, great Pinot Noir, um, some wonderful Pinot Noirs, actually. Um, but this is their sparkling wine. And um, we say sparkling wine because uh, it's not champagne, not being from the region of champagne in, in France. Um, but uh, what are your first thoughts on it? Um, very dry, very dry. Yeah. So again, you see the darker color. And so you, you think it's, it's going to, um, you know, overpower you. And it's actually, it's actually very, very light. Actually yeah. Very and light. this is, you know, we, um, I say we as, as producers in uh, in the U.S., obviously in Champagne, they've been making sparkling wine, uh, Champagne for, you know, hundreds of years. And uh, this is a style that actually is, has been around for quite a while. In fact, you usually pay a premium for um, for rosé, sparkling wine, or Champagne. So if you were to go look at the Champagne section in your local retail store, you'd probably see that there would be sort of the quote unquote, you know, regular version of that champagne and the the rosé version it would be a little bit more um typically when you are making sparkling rosé um wine as opposed to grenache syrah and morvedre that we use what we call the still wines or the wines without fizz um you're using red grapes like pinot noir and pinot meunier uh you use those because most sparkling wine or champagne um uh, I don't want to say requires, but needs a really good bit of acidity to it. So those two varieties benefit 
typically from cooler climates um, where you can get a little bit more of a higher acid, a little more of a crisp taste to it. And um, that's what you've got um, in typically uh, true champ rosé champagne, but also as you can probably taste um, in this wine, uh, is this wine as well. Um, I will tell you, Shane, this wine is still very small production. There's some of it you can find in different states. I don't know if you can find this in, in Miami or in Florida just yet, but, um, but it's, uh, it's coming, I promise you. There's, there's a lot of this that's being uh, produced right now. It's a pretty exciting project. Uh, they also make a really interesting style of wine called Piquette, which is a um, kind of a lower alcohol rosé with a slight bit of sparkling to it. Um, and then they also make a true champagne uh, as well. So a really interesting kind of mix of uh, mix of wines. Well, Brent, so like, how, how should we think about the rosé champagne, <clears throat> or rosé sparkling wine? You know, it, it, that it's it's kind of like a, a weird um, thing that you see in the wine store. You know, is it celebratory? Is it with is it with food? And so for someone who I, I think that is probably the most intimidating bottle that you'll find at, at your local bottle store um you know so so like how should we explain this if you break this out you know hey let's try this 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 rosé sparkling wine um you know how would you how would you think about it how would you explain it how would you how would you describe it yeah so it's an interesting question because i think for those of us that are in the wine business you look at rosé champagne as almost being well no, not almost as like a premium wine almost above what you would consider um, uh, you know, quote unquote, regular champagne. Um, but um, I think you're right in describing it to people. Once again, you come up with that rosé, you come up with the color, the color complex. People look at that and they say, oh, you know, it must be sweet or, you know, what is it? I think uh, for me, Shane, the, the thing that rosé champagne comes to the table with, and remember we talked earlier about the production of rosé and the skin contact, and that it wasn't just color that you get from the skin. You get a lot of aromatic and flavor compounds. That's where the clue is. Rosé champagne tends to have a lot more richness to it. For me, a lot more body and a little bit more structure and flavor. So um, that's what I love about rosé champagne. Now, I, I also like, I mean, I'm a huge champagne fan. I absolutely love it. Um, I think it's one of the most versatile wines that's made on the planet. But um, you get with, um, forgive this, you know, the clear, clear champagne, quote unquote, regular champagne. You get a very sort of light, creamy, kind of yeasty quality to it. Well, then when you move up to the rosé, it's almost like, um, you know, when you bite like the skins of grapes, and I'm not talking about necessarily wine grapes. I mean, just skins of like even table grapes has that slight astringent kind of quality to it, um, but still super flavorful. That's exactly what I get in, in rosé champagne. So back to your point about, you know, when you're, if you're opening it for friends, um, you know, us in the wine business would look at that as something that's, you know, oh, Shane's opening up something really special. Um, for maybe guests who don't know a lot about wine, um, I think it may warrant, you know, a brief just sort of description to say, hey, you know what, if it is true champagne, um, uh, you know, there's there's three grape varieties used in Champagne, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, and Pinot Noir. Two of those are red grape varieties. So it's not unusual for you to, um, uh, you know, see, you know, like anyone. Um, what's that? It's not unusual to be like anyone. You know, not unusual, <laughs> not unusual. Um, in fact, I think that it, um, I think it actually shows us, you know, a little bit of uh, a little quality a little. and, and a little Tom Jones, sorry. Whenever, some, no, whenever no, I, someone, it's not, it's not unusual. I, 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 I you. got it. I'm I got sorry. it. <laughs> sorry. You know, if we only had a more custom version of Zoom, I probably could have mixed in the mixed in the track if you and I had planned this, you know, ahead of time. But anyway, we'll save that. Which, by the way, at Battier Tom Jones with, with Cabernet. Sorry. Okay, so at Batty with Cabernet, Cabernet, there is uh, a very good uh, karaoke component. So um, maybe. You know, you opening a bottle of rosé or sabring a bottle of rosé, singing that would be uh, would be appropriate. That's an excellent idea. Thank you. We could try it. We could try it. Um, so Shane, another a question, if you don't mind. Um, someone knows that um, your is Pat Riley your GM or president? I guess he's president, isn't he? He's our president. Yes. Okay. So evidently, he's into wine. Is that true? And if so, have yep. you drank wine with him? <laughs> I have. And uh, my, my favorite Pat Riley story is, is with wine. He drinks big time wines. Okay. And, and um, 
he has a, a Christmas party every year at his house. The whole, you know, all the front office, all the players go. And um, we went over there and we have a, a you know, a white, a white elephant, dirty Santa, you know, shindig. And uh, the one year that we did it, you know, a lot of people bring wine. So I, I got, you know, I had a bottle, I think it was a bottle of Camus, you know, whatever. Um, um, not, you know, maybe, maybe not even Camus. It was, it was something, it was a nice, nice bottle, you know, probably a hundred, hundred buck, hundred dollar bottle of wine. And uh, I put it down and by the end of the night, someone had left with it. And so oh, wow. I'm, like, oh, I'm like, oh man, like someone took my wine, I'm bummed. And Pat's like, oh, don't worry about that. I got you. Goes into his, you know, his everyday drinking and pulls out a bottle of Colgan and gives it to me. And wow. it's like, here, Merry Christmas. And I'm like, I'm glad I left this. I'm, I'm glad I lost the other uh, bottle of wine. <laughs> so, so he's drinking Colgan, you know, every, that's his everyday wine. That's, that's sure. how much of a Don sure. Pat Riley is. And uh, I, I was a beneficiary of that. So, <laughs> well, at least he shares. That's nice. Most good wine yes, people, does. most, yes, most good wine people share. Um, Riley is very generous when it comes to his wine. So I, I, yeah. I appreciate it. Um, Shane, there's another question here from um, uh, from someone. So besides Napa wine, uh, what are your other favorites? So and maybe kind of dovetailing to that question I have, like what I mean, what are what are some uh, some other wines that you drink that are you know non Napa that are you know that yeah. do you have a go to wine or is it something? Do you yeah. are you pretty so adventurous? What, what you know, my my like Tuesday night wine is uh, anything from Saint Emilion. It's very reasonable. Okay. Um, French wine, a little lighter, you know, when I'm, when I'm just hanging out with Heidi or, you know, on a Tuesday, Wednesday night, Saint Emilion. I love, I love a good Nebbiolo, a little, 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 little stronger, um, but just a little bit, a little different, uh, you know, Napa cabs are my, are my, are my favorite, obviously. Sure. Sure. Um, just, just for, for variety, Nebb Nebbiolos, um, you know, super Tuscan every now and then, but you know, I, I do like a, a lighter French wine just to, to throw a curveball in there. Sure. I'm not super versed on Bordeaux's. Um, but I'm have you guys been out there before to Bordeaux? I've not, I've not. Okay, it's on, it's on, okay. The, it's on the list. So, um, now Bordeaux's are really intimidating for an Americano, um, as, as are Italian wines, but I love both when, when I'm when I'm poured a great Italian or. Or French wine, I, you know it immediately, and um, and so I've, I've I've enjoyed learning about those two regions and sort of sure. expanding my, my palate a little bit. Um, so those, those are the areas where I tend to I, I, I tend to I tend to wander. If, if I want something a little lighter, I, I go uh, a nice French Chablis in the summer, uh, a little lighter white wine, uh, or a, a, a fumé uh, a fumé blanc. Um, uh, so that, that's that's where I, that that's sort okay. of my new exploratory uh, region, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can and drink as much as I can just to to, to figure out the nuances. But I always end up going back to to California reds. Yeah, that's that's sort of what happens, right? You kind of do your you know you're exploring, and then there's always something that kind of usually pulls you back in, whatever that is. And yep. well, thankful for us in Napa that you enjoy <laughs> Napa cabs, and not only that, you bring your friends too. So <laughs> I, I do. We're, we're, we have that's we great. actually have our Fantasy football draft in Napa this year, which I'm super awesome. excited. So my my fantasy football league, I'm the commissioner of. And it's a very special league of my my friends, my best friend, Mike Dunleavy, who's the assistant GM for the Golden State Warriors, who you, you've met and uh, had, right. had a good time with. Um, and a bunch of our college buddies and and our wives are friends. And so the, the winner gets to pick where we hold the annual fantasy football draft every year. And so Mike Dunleavy actually won it for the first time. Congratulations, Mike. And so awesome. being a Bay, a Bay Area native, he's bringing the whole crew out to Napa Valley. And so we're going awesome. to the house and do a few tastings and a dinner. And, uh, you know, the, the centerpiece of that weekend is always uh, Saturday, the draft. And so it's a very serious time, but I'm, I'm sure with a few bottles open, it will, uh, you know, quickly devolve into debauchery. But we're very excited about coming come, coming out to Napa. Uh, That's great. Drafting and uh, having a great time this year. That's great. That's great. We're, we're excited to host you. We're excited to host everyone that wants to come back to Napa. We're finally opening back up like most of the country. And um, 
easy to uh, have a great time in uh, uh, in Northern California, Napa and Sonoma. So, so come on back. Um, another question here, Sam, this one's for me, um, but I think you'll find this interesting. So there's a question about um, how the wine is produced. And so yeah. the question is, so do you direct press, this is in relation to the, the side light, do you direct press like in Provence? So um, there's really two different ways, uh, there's a couple, but I mean, really two different ways to make rosé. So um, one is to actually take the grapes and put them into uh, a vessel, and I'm just going to say a tank, fermentation tank. And um, as you begin to leach out juice and fermentation begins or, or, or almost begins, you can, if you imagine uh, bleeding off what the French call saigné, pull off that juice um, after about 12 to 24 hours of, uh, of, of that juice and skin contact kind of, you know, happening. The other way to do it is to what's called direct press, which means that you put the grapes into an actual press, press that, and you immediately take that juice and put it, you know, and, and put it off. Um, and so, yes, what we do is the direct press method. And what that means is that um, what's interesting is the, the Sanye method for many years was a way for, and actually Shane, you were talking about Bordeaux, this happened a lot in Bordeaux, where you could actually uh, produce a wine. Um, so you would press the, press, the, um, uh, press the grapes. And if you didn't think the wine was concentrated enough at that early stage, you could siphon off some of that juice. So if you siphoned off the juice, you would still have all those skins still here in that tank and a little bit less juice this time. So, so the ratio of juice, I'm sorry, the ratio of skin to juice um, would be greater. So you would expect to get a little more color from that. And that juice that you bled off would typically just go down the drain or you would, you know, it would be the, the wine that you would uh, kind of make and you would give the, the, the people that would work in the vineyards for you. Um, so it wasn't always seen as a quality method of production. Um, but now actually the Sanye method is a, is a pretty common practice, but we do it differently. It is a direct press, which means that when we, when we pick the fruit, we're picking the fruit at a certain acid level and sugar level. We want it to be a little bit, the word is not less ripe, but we don't want it to be as ripe as for making a standard wine that would have been a blend of Grenache, Syrah, and Morvedre, a red version of it, if that makes sense. So that's why in Bordeaux, when they were trying to concentrate their wines, I mean, they're, they're picking grapes at a certain sugar level and color and concentration to make really world-class red wine. So in doing that, they were siphoning off some juice and concentrating it. Um, so that stuff was seen as not as, as being kind of inferior, but, um, but no, we pick to a certain quality level. We know that when we pick this fruit, it's destined to produce rosé, nothing else. And so when we press this, it's all, it's all direct. So that was, um, that was, I don't know, Mark, I think X asked that question. So thank you. Thank you, Mark, for, um, for that. Um, Shane, so what else is going on with you right now? I know you've got your your um, your charity work. Um, uh, obviously, you've got an amazing family that you've talked a little bit about. You love golf. Um, what are you currently doing for the Miami Heat? For those of you who, for those out there who don't know exactly what your role is with the uh, with the team. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually transitioning to a uh, more of a strategic advisor role with the Heat. Uh, for the last four years, I ran the the basketball analytics department for the Heat, um, but I did such a great job of hiring uh, some young <laughs> managers. They can do a much better job than I can, so I'm stepping away from that role and uh, let, letting those guys uh, run with the data analytics, and I'm stepping more into a strategic advisory role with Miami Heat. That's great. Does any of that work uh, involve uh, anything overseas? I mean, I know that um, you guys have had you know a fair share of players from, from overseas, but um, how does that exactly work? Yeah, well, look, one of the strengths of our organization is that uh, we have an amazing scouting staff. And, you know, people ask all the time, how do you find players, um, you know, around the globe? And I think people will be shocked at the level of, of education and awareness that all these teams have on every player around the world. So if you, if you are over six foot four, and you can run and jump and chew gum at the same time and have a 
a modicum, a modicum of athleticism, you're on our radar. All right. And so um, to all the parents out there who are who have kids and are in youth sports, like do not despair. Like if you knew how much money was invested in scouting, you, your, your children will not slip through the cracks. I know a lot of parents get fired up. You know, I'm a parent myself. I have a 13 year old son and 10 year old daughter. Both of them play travel basketball and travel soccer. And parents are always scared that, uh, you know, the coach doesn't play my kid. My, my kid doesn't get the ball. He's not getting an opportunity. If they can play, you will be found. You will get a college scholarship, all right? But only if they are worthy of it, all right? So don't worry about the opportunity. People who excel in sports reveal themselves, okay? So despite all of our wants and our wishes and our hopes and our dreams for our kids, we cannot will a college scholarship, people. <laughs> we, cannot, <laughs> we, we cannot will a professional career. It will be revealed to you through their talent, through their work, through their discipline, through their, through their ethic. And, uh, you know, I, I lived it and uh, on, on both ends as a player now, now, now as a parent. And so that, that's my advice to all the parents watching, just support your kids, you know, tell them they're wonderful, tell them to play hard, be a good teammate and, uh, and take the lessons from sports, which we, which we all should. And that, that's just good sportsmanship, good competition, work ethic, learning how to deal with adversity. Um, and so that, that's, that's, that's my rant as, as, as a soccer dad myself and someone who has been through the system myself. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Good advice. Um, and, uh, Sorry you know, and, you. no, no, no. And you know, what's funny, Shane, is that analytics is becoming, you know, so much more, um, for better, or for worse. I mean, I'm not, there, there's, there's probably pros and cons that, that, uh, I'm not as versed in, um, at least in sports analytics, but, uh, we're so much of a data-driven society, and I think a lot of, you know, kids, you know, they don't realize that, hey, maybe I can't be that, you know, professional athlete, but you know what, there's some pretty interesting careers if I love sports to maybe get into with, you know, a background in data science or, or computer science, and because um, you're seeing GMs, you're seeing, um, uh, you know, the first person I remember was someone who I know you um you uh, you played uh, I don't say under but you know Daryl Morey with the Houston Rockets and and now at the 76ers I mean he was always a big data driven person and you see that's becoming more and more a part of the um, of the sports landscape and uh, and you're seeing younger people getting jobs uh, I don't say because of that but that have those skill sets and, and they're moving in it is it is you know but what I tell people all the time is that look if, if you're a young person trying to make a difference. Um, the formula is not changing. So even though we live in a world that's more data oriented and you have to have an understanding of how the numbers and the data is produced and, and, and works, um, it's, it's still old school values of working hard, being a good person, you know, benevolence, integrity, and competency. You know, I, I tell that to people all the time and that, that, is, that, is, the way you, that is the way you create trust in any industry you're in, benevolent, benevolent, benevolently, benevolency, integrity, and trust, trust are, uh, are the ways to, uh, to make a mark. And uh, I would agree with you. You know, and I tell kids all the time that I just, this, this advice holds true for uh, adults too, that I had one goal as a basketball player. And that was to make my coach's life uh, really, really hard. And I wanted him to sweat every single minute I was on the bench. <laughs> you know, like, wow, that's a good way to look know, at it I, I played batty 46 minutes tonight i need to find a way to play in 48 and so every <laughs> moment i was away from the game off the floor um i wanted him to sweat and say i need to play batty more and so make make your coach make your boss make your manager make what make your parents make them sweat whenever you're not involved and the only way you do that is through uh, being about the team, being about winning, being about positivity, being about work ethic. You know, the same is true in winemaking or, or basketball, sure is. right? You know, make, make yourself invaluable to the process. And I promise you, you always have value, you always have a job, and you always have opportunity. That's right. You know, I tell a lot of people, they, that people look at the wine industry and probably, you know, professional sports to some level. Um, it, it, it looks kind of romantic on the outside and what people don't realize there's a lot of hard work into it. And, 
you know, the wine business, uh, when it comes to production, I always tell people it's like working in a kitchen. I mean, it's like you are on your feet. You're doing a lot of cleaning before you're doing anything else. And you're working hard, long hours. And, um, you know, if you're doing something that you love, that, that, that kind of uh, doesn't even seem like work, you know. And, yeah. um, uh, but, uh, but you're right. You want to, that's a great way to put it. I, want, I do. I want someone to worry if I'm not in the game. You know, if I, if, <laughs> exactly. if, if I'm if not participating, wine, hmm, you know, that, that's, that, that's I'm going to worry. <laughs> so Shane, one of the, one of the really interesting things, and a lot of us that, um, that live in Napa that are, that are producers, um, uh, you know, we're seeing this. In fact, one of my good friends, who's a, a well-known uh, and very fantastic guy, who's a, um, a driver in Napa. So if anyone ever comes to Napa and need a driver, I know Shane, you've got a good go-to and I've got a great go-to as well. Um, he saw Michael Jordan's, uh, uh, or at least his, his, his aircraft parked at the Napa, Napa Jet Center. There's a lot of basketball players that are really getting into wine. Um, that has not seemed to slow down. In fact, I saw a post, I don't know if it was, it was definitely Draymond Green, he was with somebody else. Um, and, you know, posting with this really, this picture, this very high-end uh, wine called Latache from, from Burgundy, France. Um, do you still see players that are, I mean, is it sort of this cascading effect, domino effect of players getting into wine? I mean, you guys travel together. You always spend a lot of time together, you know, on the road. I know you don't travel as much anymore uh, with the team, but um, what is, are you seeing more players that are, that are getting into, getting into wine, NBA yeah, in particular? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, you know, the cool thing about the Instagram generation is that they're exposed to a lot more things. And, you know, when I started uh, back in the NBA, you know, 20 years ago, um, there just wasn't that much, much exposure to wine. Um, but now with Instagram and social media, people are exposed to great brands and great varietals and they want to try things. They want, they want to be more um than just a basketball player and so it's really cool to, to hear some of the conversations and jimmy butler plays for the miami heat is a great wine collector and um a great drinker and um it's great for the industry it's great you know the, the more we can bring people into wine because what what is wine at its core it, it's farming but sharing it's, it's, yep it's, sharing. it's community and and um you know you have more hugs and handshakes than arguments over a bottle of wine, right? And, <laughs> that's true. So that's, you know, we, you know, in this increasingly digital technical world, um, you can't substitute the the warm and fuzz that you get from sharing a bottle of wine with friends, right? And so that, yeah, that that's why we right. that, that that's why we do this, and that's why we're passionate about it because we know the power um, of, of really just healing people, healing healing the world. And so it's it's just, it's just it's really cool to see that. Uh, with my MBA brotherhood, uh, which hasn't always been the case. Yeah, that's that's great. I think you're right. I think social media probably plays a, a large role in that. But I think um, I think too that you know there's um, that I think there's this there's been this I don't want to call it level of, uh, leveling of a playing field, but I think there's people have more access to wine. There's a lot more wine out there than there ever has been before. Okay. And whether it's you know kind of what you said, Shane, where you're you've gravitated maybe to your, you know, uh, your saint to me on, uh, you know, your, some of your Bordeaux's that you were talking about trying and then you're, but you're circling back to your Napa Reds. Um, there's, there's this, you know, you, as you broaden your taste, you realize that wine does not have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be this elitist beverage. In fact, we're probably one of the only countries that, you know, I think it's, it's definitely changing, but in the past it was seen as kind of an elitist beverage because to your point, it's all about farming whether it's, you know, sugar cane, soybeans, corn. I mean, we're still in the farming business. And, um, you know, as you know, well, we've had um, in Napa some pretty challenging vintages going back to 2017, 2020, most recently with the fires. Um, so those are things that, you know, it makes you appreciate a little bit more kind of what we're doing. And so um, when you are sharing that bottle of wine, when you are getting together, it's really important to, you know, kind of uh, remember, you know, that this is a social beverage. There's a lot of history behind it. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to break down barriers. And, um, and obviously I know that uh, my interactions with you have been around one have been some of the best because of that. So it's always, it's always great. Um, Shane, we are down to the wire and I, I just want to make sure that I take some time to um, just kind of uh, reset a couple things and, and let people know where they can get more information about your charity. So um, I told, uh, 
I told you, Shane, that I really want to sell out of these hats. So um, these bucket hats. So I'm going to get one. And what I'm asking is everyone out there who's listening, everyone out there who's listening tonight, um, if you can uh, go scroll back up. I know Benchmark has been kind enough to put this in the chat thread now so you guys can see this. You can go check out uh, Shane's Instagram. You can actually check the link that that links you directly rather uh, to these bucket hats. And, um, you know, you, you got to have another family member that wants one. So, you know, buy two, maybe three, you know, just <laughs> it's hot. It's hot. So uh, we're going to need those bucket hats more and more, especially where I am here in Texas right now. Um, so there's the link to that in the chat thread. Um, there's a link to Shane's Instagram account, um, obviously mine, if you want to, if you want to follow me as well. And um, above all that, if you can go to uh, um, the Take Charge Foundation, we put a link in the chat thread as well. Go there, put your name in the contact form. You'll get an alert when this event happens, the Battier with Cabernet, Cabernet. I promise you, it is absolutely amazing. You drink so much more wine. Uh, than the ticket amount that you pay to get in the doors. It's an absolutely fun event. You get a chance to mingle with vintners, primarily from Napa, taste some amazing wines. Um, potentially, uh, potentially, uh, you will see Shane sing, um, and uh, just have a have a have an absolute have an absolute blast in Miami in January when everyone wants to go to Miami. So we'll do that. Um, Shane, it is always a pleasure to have you on. It's been a while since I've seen you in person, so I'm hoping that I can see you before this, you know, January event, if that's the month that you choose. But like um, you're real, you're real kind to take part. Um, in all sincerity, there, you know, we get pulled in different directions in Napa with wineries about supporting different charities, and I'm not just saying this because I've known you for a while, but but um, I think I shouldn't think I know what you're doing with your charity. I think impacts. Um, really does a lot of a lot of amazing work and with impacting young people, which, you know, let's face it, we're getting older. We want to we want to make sure these young people get off to a really good start. Um, um, and um, yeah, I want those young people to be, as you describe, the person that says, you know what, I want my boss. I want my coach. Um, I want them to sweat because they they need to put me back in the game because I'm there person i'm the person that's going to make the make that make the change um and um i think it's it's fantastic so anyway that's enough about me talking about your charity but it's been it's absolutely amazing i've enjoyed taking part um shane a final toast maybe hello cheers my friend thank you for joining cheers. us i really appreciate your time you're you're a great wine lover great player great person most importantly great person uh and i know a fantastic i know a fantastic dad so anyway a belated well, happy father's day and um, say, say hello to your family for me please newell included do. and uh you. and you Park wine well you guys keep absolutely. doing what you're doing thank you Shane. okay let's watch italy in the uh in the euro matches okay cool let's, we'll, we'll cheer them on for, for luca luca we're looking out for, for luca let's go luca luca <laughs> <laughs> take care shane Hey, All right, cheers.